believe it. I've taught for two years and I still forget. All right, so we are on the first section of the class was you're getting introduced to the classical virtues and we focused on the personal virtues. Another main theme of this class, the union of reason and faith. Socrates and Jesus had the same virtues. One of them in the name of a certain religious tradition, the other one in the name of natural reason and natural wisdom. The Western intellectual tradition for many centuries wove those together. Um, so it's a major cornerstone of the Western tradition. All right, that's number one. Uh, we ended with some articles about depression, stress, whatever, that again, link recent developments in science and social science, revenge and forgiveness, that was a social scientist, um, with religion or values. So that is what goes on in our world now. There's just hundreds of, multiple hundreds of types of uniting reason and faith. Um, the thing that surprises me is so many of them think that they've come up with something brand new. Like you, <laughs> you just wouldn't believe it. How many think, oh, nobody else knows this. I've got to spread the word. And it's just kind of, please. Uh, you didn't get educated in college. Most college students never get this basic foundation. And so, you know, when they're 40 and have their midlife crisis, they figure it out, but they think it's brand new. So, okay. Um, so the second section is about the political virtues. So that was on the list after there's personal virtues, social virtues, political virtues citizens living together under a common body of laws, different kinds of laws, um, et cetera, et cetera. But the first lecture was the virtue of an educated citizens that the US founders were very concerned that citizens get educated so they're not manipulated by power hungry people who want to get elected so they will manipulate the public to vote for them. Or they'll, they'll just cut taxes so they can get elected, even though that means there's no money for schools. And people don't vote on their, their self-interest, long-term self-interest. They just vote on greed, how much money they'll have in their pocket next month. And this is gonna destroy a democracy no middle class. Uh, anyway, that was that. Then we had how you take those same virtues and apply it to management. That can be business, it can be education, it can be government, it can be healthcare, any kind of management, any kind of manager, coaches. So ruling for the sake of the ruled, setting a good role model, all that kind of stuff. Today, we have two themes. One of them was leadership, taking those virtues, and this would be political leaders throughout the world, exercising these virtues. And then the other part was women's rights, right? Ex women exercising those virtues and leaders making laws and applying laws in a way that promote the flourishing specifically of women, because women have traditionally been a, a, an oppressed class, right? They're by far the biggest class that's been oppressed, <laughs> right? They're over half the people and they still have been oppressed. All right, so uh, I'm gonna start out asking you, each of you to give, uh, to tell me all your comments. You could have one, two, or three. And so Mia, what have you got? Sorry, I had to grab a pencil. I just completely forgot. Um, so for my first, I guess, like kind of point that I picked out, hold on, let me pick up my notes really quick. 
Um, oh, well, I guess my first thing, I had a question about the first uh, paper that we read. It was the mix of the, like talking about the mix of aristocracy and democracy about how that would be like kind of like the best scenario, like best, but I don't, I don't know the way it was explained. I thought that's what we had. It is what we have. Oh, okay. I guess I was confused. So, and then my next question, like, I kind of, I guess I don't really understand, like, what is the difference? Because I've always been told that we just have a democracy. So what, what exactly does, does the aristocracy just bring in the elect, like the officials that kind of make the like last decision or what, like, what is that? Okay, I think it's very interesting because this is what I vote on the basis of is which presidential candidate is going to appoint the better people to the cabinet. So the president's cabinet is all his appointees, okay? They aren't elected. And they are the ones that run the Environmental Protection Agency, the House and Human Services, Department of Defense, Department of State, which is a diplomatic corps, the uh, judicial, the, um, the, well, Department of Justice, the um, Department of Education, right? And I'll talk to you about that later, but those are all appointed by the president, okay? So that's a major example. And I vote on the basis of that. And I don't know anybody else who votes on the basis of that. But the reason is we could have all the environmental laws in the world, but there are presidents who have appointed people whose goal is to destroy it, who actually the Environmental Protection Agency sued these people in the past and the president appoints them to run the organization, okay? And so it becomes the Environmental Destruction Agency Either they do nothing or all the laws are changed to promote fossil fuel businesses. So you use the Environmental Protection Agency to promote the fossil fuel industry, okay? And I wish more citizens knew about that. That's not in the news, right? Um, Department of Education. Anyway, there are people who appoint people who have a history of being sued by these, by uh, these agencies because the people broke the law. And so you appoint them to run it. <laughs> yeah, really, okay. And then there's other, another presidential candidate who will appoint somebody who's really smart, really motivated, dedicated to promoting a middle class, really informed, knows who to, who to hire beneath them, create this whole collective mind of experts on this area, and they will do a better job for four years than people who are put on that simply because they donated to the campaign and their job is to destroy it. <laughs> and I'm not exaggerating. It's just, anyway, that answers your question, Mia, right? You know. Uh in theory this the system should be best but it's going to be abusive used by oh that sucks well okay. but, but you should keep up with it right true i never i didn't know that i didn't know about the environmental thing yeah i'll talk to you about the department of education if we have time because that's okay. the, that's the one that hits the students the hardest right and they know that they're affected by what the federal government does with education. But I, I don't wanna talk about that at the, at the moment. Okay. Um, but I, I did, I'm glad you pointed out that thing on polity. And did you, did I answer your question? Oh, yes, ma'am. I, I was just confused by like, cause I've always been explained to that we have a democracy, but then that made it sound like we had that. And so we do, but it's just abused, so. Well, in theory, we elect uh, senators, congressmen, people, and they pass the laws. 
in theory, those agencies' jobs is to enforce the law, right? It's just that a president can appoint someone who will not only inf not enforce it, they'll undermine it. Right. Now that isn't the problem with the way the system is organized. That's a problem with the corruption of the person running the system. Okay, so Melanie, does that make sense in relation to your paper? Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, and I could explain to you why I think we need an environmental protection agency. And I mean, I could go on and on because I'm an old lady and I've been following it for 50 years, but you don't probably don't want to hear all that. Um, anyway, I think that was a good point, Mia. And one of the reasons it might have been confusing is the, the audience of that paper is international. So I wasn't specific to the United States. Does that make sense? Yes, ma'am. Okay, I think there are many governments who have a combination of elected officials and appointed officials. All of Europe has that. All the ones that we call free societies. Um, all right. That's enough, but that's a really good, important thing for students to know. Okay, Alex, what do you think? Well, from the last class I was in, we were talking about um, like corrupt politician positions. And um, I've been thinking about uh, like what I learned in high school. Um, like the, there's this triangle of like, uh, rhetoric that we learned from Socrates or Plato, Plato I don't remember. It was um, logos, pathos, and uh, I forgot the other one. Well, it could be eros, it could be um, ethos. ethos. <laughs> okay. Logos, pathos, and ethos. Okay. One Okay, so you're British. Okay. Sorry. All right. Now it's off. Now your mic's off. Oh, so sorry. Um, so uh, one way I've been able to navigate through like understanding my place in um, politics and how I understand it um, and what I support and don't support is seeing who uses, what politicians use those three um, equally? Because there are some that like overuse um, pathos, which is uh, people's emotions in their arguments or overuse their uh, uh, ego or egos, egos pathos, logos. Uh, it, 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 like, e or egos or, or ethos. Uh, ethos is their basically their way of life their a way of life or like some people well, my definition of it in my head was like their uh their their position or their power over people um and um there there is a trend where when you overuse or like you you that that little triangle of um logic is like leaning way too heavily on one side and it's it's pretty obvious that they're trying to manipulate you into believing um some things that maybe you shouldn't right very good um you logos means arguments or explanations um you can be a really uh straight talker Right, you can tell the truth, or you can also be a great deceiver, <laughs> or you know, you can. And then with pathos, you can appeal to fear, appeal to fantasy, appeal to all sorts of emotions, and do it in an emotional tone of voice, right? Um, and then with ethos, is your appeal to values, right? And that gets corrupted by Christian hiding behind being a Christian, right? And does that make sense to you? I mean, a politician should have values and character, but when they start preaching at you about what God wants, uh, that's that's it. Does that make sense? I understand, yeah. Uh, does that make sense to you, given those three things that you referred to? Um, 
pathos, logos, ethos. Yes, I believe so. I'm going to have to think on it a little bit, but yeah. Okay. Logos would be argument, pathos, emotion, ethos would be character, right? Okay. Um, Melanie. Um, I just thought it was interesting how everything was referred to as a right, because like having a right doesn't necessarily mean having the freedom to do something. Like, for example, um, in the central human functional capabilities, um, it says having the right to seek employment on an equal basis with others. And I thought that was interesting because still women don't have the same rights as men, like when they're getting jobs. Um, even though we have the right to apply for a job, that doesn't necessarily mean that the people in like the top management positions agree that women are smart enough to attain higher jobs. Right. Um, have you ever heard of the glass ceiling? Uh, I think we talked about it last semester. Women get promoted to a certain level and then you can't sit in the boardroom with the guys. Yeah. Um, I'm hoping in your generation that'll not be so true, but especially the women older than me, they kept running into it. They were the pioneers, you know, and then all of a sudden they hit this glass ceiling. It's not a brick wall because you can't see it with visually, right? It's not written into the laws. It's just, you never do get that promotion, right? They'll tell you, you have the opportunity and then, yeah, this other person just happened to be more qualified. <laughs> Does that make sense, Melanie? Yes. Okay. All right. So let's start out. I'm going to just speak briefly about the um, international leadership one, and we will focus mostly on women's rights, especially because we have women, right? Um, but I do want to get this. Oops, sorry, I got the wrong class. Here we go. Um, the capabilities, um, let me do, where's the outline? Well, here's the, well, here's the UN declaration. That's the United Nations. This was after World War II. There was a huge movement to try and create international culture and to promote democracy. Anyway, so this one is all about rights, all right? And also I can't, I'm not gonna elaborate, but the first 21 are related to the West and their individual's rights, okay? Not to be subject to torture, to get equal employment. But after that, 21, a right to, um, uh, a right to a job, a right to social security, that's socialism, right? A right to health care, a right to um, employment, right? And that was, so this document was written during the Cold War, where it was socialism versus capitalism, right? And they did try to synthesize it. So every country in the whole world actually except maybe North Korea, has regulated capitalism. I mean, even China allows for capitalism. They just have a heck of a lot of regulations. So, but they don't call it that. It's so funny because in the US, we call it, you know, regulated capitalism. If you're honest, you do. If you're a politician, you don't make that distinction because you want people to demonize the opposite, right? Oh, those radical left-wing socialists. Oh, those radical right-wing capitalists and whatever. But um, it's so funny because the truth is we have the United States version of regulated capitalism. It's different than Europe. Europe has more taxes and services than we do. We are the developed country with the fewest public services and the most friendly to capitalism. Um, I, 
we're something like the third best if you want to start a business and get rich. Well, and you know, but we're worst among the developed countries. We're in the bottom three when it comes to education and healthcare, public transportation, parks. Like, what do you guys want, right? And um, so, I mean, Europeans aren't going to trade with us. Uh, so it really depends on what you want. On the other hand, I was in China and they called it, um, they called it socialism with a Chinese character. That meant they were going to let the capitalists in, but they didn't call it capitalism because they have to call it socialism. <laughs> so it's funny because we call it capitalism with an American character, which means, yeah, and we have social security and, you know, and, but you have to call it capitalism. Whereas in China, you have to call it socialism, but you let the capitalists in. So I, I think that was really funny. And that's why I like to travel. Like you can't read about all this stuff. Um, so the declaration focused on rights, the United Nations capabilities focus on capabilities. You might have a right to uh, bodily health, but you're not capable of being healthy, right? You don't have any health care. <laughs> so that's a big issue in our country. You might have a right to um, uh, uh, decide who you're gonna marry. But as a matter of fact, you don't have the capability to decide that. Um, because in the village you live in, if you don't accept the person your parents choose, uh, you're, <laughs> you're gonna get booted out of the house and you'll have nothing. So the capabilities approach is what actually is happening boots on the ground, as opposed to in principle, you have a right. Um, and then, uh, okay, so the, the capabilities, Anyway, I, I didn't, I must not have put the outline there. So let's just do the, the women's, the paper on women. And I will, I'll put up the outline and you all can tell, react, right? So the paper starts out with the capabilities. And then it says, Mary Wollstonecraft. Um, so Melanie has, re has read this before. And so I'm gonna have, Nia and Alex respond first, and then Melanie, you can ask them questions or you can point out this time, reading it over this time, you notice some different things. But the, the issue in the paper is that one of those capabilities is called practical reason. The capability, number F, to form a conception of the good and to engage in reflection, planning your life to achieve your idea of the good. Now that sounds really sophisticated. I mean, come on, Dr. Beck, you gotta eat, you gotta survive, you gotta not get raped, you gotta, you know, this practical reason looks very esoteric. It's only privileged women in a privileged society that would have it. So, my claim is that the way a society is structured is based on that idea. And when women, the idea of practical reason was that women were not by nature capable of full humanity because they didn't have those high, highest order capacities to think theoretically. Their natural place was in the home. And so Mary Wollstonecraft, years and years ago, um, what, 200 years ago? Almost 200, 170, um, said that when you deny women equal intellectual capacity, when you deny them complete use of their reason, you justify all the other kinds of discrimination. Okay, how does that happen? And, and also that it's a contradiction, right? If these guys that she lived around, right? You have to be virtuous to be saved. Women have free will. They can get saved or damned, right? Um, 
But if you have to be virtuous to be saved, and you have to use your reason to be virtuous, then there's no God who would tell you, okay, you have a free will, uh, good luck. I'm not gonna give you the power of reason to control your will. So God, you know, systematically damns every woman to hell for eternity. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Okay, so that was her argument. Uh, what is reason? The ability to generalize idea, uh, ideas, to transcend immediate experiences, to develop a conception of the good, to act on that basis. Um, but if you think women aren't capable, first of all, they're all going to go to hell, and God set it up that way. Second of all, while they're on earth, you wouldn't give them an education if you get the higher order education. So um, they don't have responsibility for their actions, right? Um, but you don't give them education. If you don't give them education, they don't have opportunities to participate in public life, right? They're not gonna get jobs or a good job. Uh, they don't have opportunities. Then she says from childhood, girls are conditioned to be um, assumed to be impulsive, assumed to be inferior, and they just grow up that way. And they get molded that way. So she's arguing that women who develop their reason are better spouses, they're better mothers, they're better citizens, they're less likely to get manipulated by uh, false uh, political rhetoric or religious rhetoric, right? And then I argue that these problems are still, still exist. And Nussbaum gives examples in developing countries. And um, anyway, that's a summary. So what other what other what reactions did you have to that mia well my specific thing was about the marriage because whenever we were looking at it it like it, i don't know if it just contradicted itself but the first thing like the first like line it says like friendship first over but then uh like further down it says that educated women or no Something about like women, uh, women, like your marriage turns into friendship. So then it's like marriage, then friendship. But then it starts off by like, like friendship first, then. So I, I don't understand that. Like, why is it backwards? Why is it? Opposite? Well, it probably could be either way, right? Um, I guess. So it can start out with a friendship and then it can become passionate. But even if it's passionate, so you marry on the basis of the passion, that's why you pick the person to marry as opposed to these other friends you have. But even within a marriage, um, the passion tends to settle, settle down to a habit. Does that make sense? Yes, ma'am. I, I think that does. I mean, is that a reasonable way to describe what? uh what you think ought to happen or does happen or i mean i definitely do think that a lot of marriages happen based off of passion but i also think that that's why like 50 percent of marriages end in divorce because like if you're only going off of passion then you have no real connection there but that's a whole nother i guess conversation i i was just confused about that specific specific part when we were reading it because i don't know i was just like very confused on wh what the standpoint was there because if it's marriage first then friendship like what like i guess i was confused on what was supposed supposed to happen you know so like what 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 would be better i guess like if you especially for like the female involved like what would be better is it better for us to have like a connection first and then or like i don't know so many questions off of that. Well, the other thing is, do you know people that you're sexually attracted to, but you don't have any respect for them? 
as people? Not really, no. Okay, you can imagine it though, right? Yeah, I'm sure it happens a lot though. And you wouldn't want to marry that person, right? Right. Okay, so I do think before they get married, people think that they have some respect for each other. I mean, you're not going to marry somebody you don't respect at all, right? Right, yeah. Okay, so anyway, you could, you know, have the sexual attraction, then you find out you actually like the person. Um, so anyway, I mean, it's at, at the end of the day, it's a long-term commitment, right? And it should include both. Um, Alex, what about you? Um, so as I was reading the papers, I was getting a little frustrated. Um, well, one, because like, it's, it's, it's clearly obvious that it's not that women are un, like, in, that women are inferior um, but that society makes us inferior uh, because one, they're not giving us the same opportunities or education. And I really, I do agree with that. Like education is the, the, the equalizer, um, but it has to be given to us. We have to like ask and beg for it, which is really frustrating. And um, I was just wondering, like, where where did the the notion that women were inferior come from? Because like, we were just born into it, and it was just that. And there are a lot of cultures out there that that do like praise the women and um, like worship them because women are the source of offspring, our future. Right. It's it's odd, like. Where did that it's come odd. from? <laughs> it is odd. Women actually goddesses, the goddess was the center for 30,000 years. And then there was this switch. Um, yeah, so actually I'll go over that when we do the other outline, John Stuart Mill. He says it was just might makes right. It was never tested. Um, you could say that you could give an economic explanation. That's what um, Engels, Marx and Engels. So it started out where the economic center was in the household, right? That's where farming, weaving, you know, everything for survival was done at home. But then at a certain point, the economic activity was away from home. So you had to leave the house. Maybe you go hunting or you have to travel. And then when that was when guys left the house because women are taking care of babies. And then when they had more economic power, then they took over. Okay. Does that make sense, Alex? That makes a lot of sense, actually, because I am an economics major. Oh, okay. Well, I would love to, you know, if you wanted to minor in our PhD and you could write a paper about um, linking the discipline of economics with humanities, because this is a serious global problem. So would that be like anthropology? Well, it's, it just synthesizes all of them, right? Um, so anthropology is a study of culture. Karl Marx just said, everything called culture is just a matter of money. Who has it? Who, okay. So anyway, if you wanted to explore the possibility of writing an advanced seminar paper where you synthesize all this stuff, that would be great. Um, Melanie, what would you like to say? Um, I just, I guess I just wanted to comment on where she, her argument, um, like denying women equal intellectual ability leads to and is the justification for all other kinds of discrimination. Um, and I think that's super important because, you know, women are thought to be less, less of intellectually than men. And as I was saying before, you know, we have the rights to do the same, do most of the same things as men. But 
people in power positions still don't believe that women have the same capabilities. So I guess my question just is, you know, how do we change that from here? Like, what is it that we can do? What more can we do, you know? Because yeah. laws, laws can only do so much. That's right. Just like that was the theme of the first, right? Athens that was the problem, the laws, there was a problem in corruption of the citizens, right? And so, yeah, well, for example, I used to have a woman from the career services come and give a presentation. Now this changes over time. So I don't know what the situation is now, but she started out with a survey. What sort of qualities of character do you look for in a boss? Okay, blah, 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 blah. Then what qualities of character do you associate with men as opposed to women? blah, 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 blah. Then which would you prefer as a boss, a man or a woman? Okay, what do you think happens on those surveys? Men prefer men and women prefer women? No, actually they all prefer the qualities of character of women, but they want a man boss. Okay, who would you prefer to be your boss, Mr. Biden or Mr. Trump? That's just an open question, right? Would you elect someone that you don't, wouldn't want to be your boss, right? Well, do people elect people that they don't want to be their boss? <laughs> Just for starters, that's without even, you know, it's, it, I don't know, it sort of amazes me. But anyway, so Melanie, that's part of the problem, right, Melanie? Yes. So on paper, you know, you have, I'm going to interview for a job or I'm going to evaluate my boss and my boss's, you know, reputation. And their promotion depends upon these surveys from their employees. And yet the woman does everything employees want, but because she's a woman, she gets ranked lower. And this happens. This has happened throughout my career. Women in general get ranked lower. Um, and so um, provosts, you know, deans, academic deans in college, colleges have to factor in that students in general rank women lower. And there's no evidence other than this unconscious sexism. Um, anyway, so that's, that's a big problem. Um, Mia, can you think of an example where you think you've experienced sexism or where, you know, I don't know, it's an example of discrimination where people think they're not sexist, but they actually are. Mm, yes. So uh, um, I uh, so I sing and I used to be in uh, basically this sort of like program where I, I thought that it was, that's what I wanted my career path to be at the time. Um, so from the ages of like 12 to 15, I quit at 15, I would always sing and it's sexism, but not necessarily, it didn't stop me from doing things necessarily. It's just like the way that I was marketed basically was very like, um, I wasn't allowed to sing the music that I liked to sing. And I wasn't allowed to like, um, you know, do what was best for like my voice instead it was like let's sing these very sexual songs and they put me in front of all of these um like at the age of like 13 it was so bad like this is like what started my just like absolute worst time of my life but like they put me in these bars to sing in front of all of these like you know obviously drunk guys and they would put me in these outfits that were like super just like tight and sleek and that's fine you can wear whatever you want but that wasn't the reason that you know, you have this like 13 year old that looks like 
an 18 year old who looks like an adult and is going in and singing for these guys and then it's like obviously you have to deal with the comments from that but yeah my entire career in the music industry was just like no so that's awful Mia it was very bad I hated should, it it should be against the law right you're a minor I mean did your parents have to give permission for you to to go into this or what so my yes um but as long as I had some sort of guardian with me um it was fine but they never like I, I would always go with she was tech I think she's technically my grandmother but like she would never actually like stay so like definitely some illegal things were happening but what I mean I'm from Texas and the part of Texas that I was from is like what are you going to do about it they're very conservative they don't like no one cares it's like I don't know it was very bad so and they're Christian right of course oh of course. <laughs> that that bugs me because I am a preacher's kid um so when you add that to no and my dad was a really nice guy right so that right. that really I mean just call yourself a lustful you know creep but don't call yourself a Christian uh just that's really hard um anyway so alex did you think of well that's a great example mia except it's pretty outrageous and i'm sorry that happened to you um i really think it's, it's, uh anyway okay alex what about you um i guess like it's my experiences aren't exactly as overt as that um but with the way I look, um, I, I have short hair. Um, I don't. I don't have a chest. Uh, I wear um, androgynous clothing. So whenever I walk into the girls' restroom, I get pretty hard stares sometimes, and it's pretty obvious that people think that I'm in the wrong restroom. And it it, it just it, it makes it, it. It used to make me frustrated, but now I really don't care. Um, but it made me question, like, what do I have to look like to you for you to, like, believe that I'm a girl? Why can't I just be? Um, do I have to have long hair? Do I have to have a chest? Do I have to show my chest? Do <laughs> Yeah, because, like, sometimes I, because it's, like, towards other girls, sometimes I would just feel like lifting up my shirt and, like, look, <laughs> I'm a girl, too. Stop it. Um, but... I guess like now that I'm so used to it, it I, I don't notice it anymore. And it doesn't even bother me that servers or people call me sir before like, cause they don't hear my voice yet. Or even when they do hear my voice, it, they're still confused. It, it doesn't bother me anymore, but we just have, we all just have uh, these constructs that of, of gender that they don't, they don't really fit anymore. So. Yeah, I remember I was, you know, I thought I didn't have any of these biases. I met these two people. They were both named Pat. They both had short hair. They both dressed in black. And it was really interesting to me because I honestly was off put. And that's when I realized I really do treat men and women differently. And I appreciated the fact that they just forced people to deal with them right that was good like their if their whole goal in life is just to raise people's consciousness that it, i thought it was great i don't think that was their whole goal in life i just think they like to dress in black and be named pat and live you know but i think that's what they liked but they also realized that they're doing a lot of people a favor but they'll probably get a lot of hostility. Uh, but I will not forget that. Then, um, you know, it's funny, Alex, because it wouldn't even cross my mind in your case. Um, and I wonder how much of that has to do with what's happened since 2002, when the Bush administration took uh, focus groups and decided they could win a whole election by focusing on gay issues and having a marriage amendment. And so that's when all this stuff became a huge deal. Um, George W. in 2000 
part of his campaign was to be compassionate conservative. And he was saying we should have civil unions for non-binary people, and then the churches can do marriage. That was part of his platform. And then afterwards, very cynically, they decided we're gonna, we're gonna feed uh, homophobia or whatever what you wanna call it to win an election and it worked. And ever since then, it's just, they keep feeding the, the flame because they can get votes. Uh, Laura Bush said after her husband wasn't president anymore that she thought that we should have civil unions and she didn't think Roe versus Wade should pass. Should, should be overturned. But I mean, that's the cynicism of it, right? And I, I you know, if, if somebody can give me examples of Democrats that are that cynical, um, I would appreciate it. But um, I just can't think of any. I mean, they don't bring in religion and, they, and then they get accused of being, you know, horrible atheists. I mean, <laughs> They could play the religion card, but they won't do it. Um, anyway, I, I don't know, but if a student has an example, that would be great. Um, I do know about the cynicism and the rhetoric. Um, let's see, anybody else wanna comment before I go into John Stuart Mill's outline? Okay, so John Stuart Mill's outline is important because it's it's genius. He's a genius. He has this whole list of arguments that are still true. And we aren't gonna probably have time in this class, but maybe next time I'll start out by saying all the same arguments apply to racism and sexual orientation. Did you figure that out, Alex? It's all the same arguments, it's amazing. Um, but anyway, so I do want each of you to pick, you know, your favorite two arguments or whatever. So I'm going to ask you, and there's so many of them. That's the genius of it, is that he really picks out this stuff that is just never stops being true. <laughs> and it's incredible, really. So, okay, so he's arguing for the equal treatment of women. You have, to, you have to get this. He's in the 19th century. This is extremely threatening. Just think about what a radical, radical change it would require, okay? Way, way, way more radical than discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation. Like what would that undermine, right? But for women, it's huge. Why is it difficult to prove something that you haven't yet experienced? This is another thing that's genius about it is he uses the scientific method, which is supposed to start out with facts in order, he uses scientific reasoning to prove that we should change everything so that what we see in front of our face is totally different, right? That's, that takes you know some mental capacity there. Why is it hard to prove? Because most of the issues, because when we try to talk about it, people get emotional. Their emotions contradict reason. The power of habits and customs and prejudice. We're unwilling to re-examine our habits. Uh, the burden of proof then is on people who argue for equality when in general, that's kind of what we assume we all agree to is freedom and equality. We live in a Western country. How come I have to prove that? You should have to prove that women wouldn't be equal and free, right? Um, it's hard to prove a negative. How can you say everything we're doing is wrong? You have to you know, create this vision um, and it's hard to know. We have these romantic ideas. Oh, instinct, you know, it's the, you know, the instinct between men and women, romanticism, religion, naturalism, what's natural. It's not natural for women. It's natural for women to stay at home. 
religion, right? Pull out the old Bible. Okay. Why is it important to speak out? And this was Alex was male domination was never initiated after the result of thought. So you didn't use a scientific method where you had a control group and then you had a group with uh, equality and then you checked them out, right? You compared them. We never had that. We never tried anything else. Uh, and of course, now we know that, yeah, for 30,000 years, we tried something else, but never in any, you know, in any sort of developed country, patriarchy came in about, I don't know, a few thousand years BC, right? Nothing, um, the origin of male domination was just might makes right. It wasn't reason. Um, it was perpetuated without any concern for social justice. So somebody has to blow the whistle and speak out. What are the counter arguments? Women accept it. He said, no, not all of them do, but I mean, and usually an oppressed class doesn't start by asking for complete change. They start by just complaining about their husbands, right? Um, Okay, they only complain about how it's being used or abused, how, how men abuse their power, not whether male power is legit. The second reason, they're afraid to complain. Obviously, if you publicly complain, you still have to go home and sleep with this guy, right? I mean, why would you complain? You're just gonna be in big trouble. Um, in no other case, is the person who's been proved to have suffered an injury put right back you know into intimate relations with the person it's a miracle that any women do complain right so all the causes social and natural combine to make it unlikely that they would ever rebel women don't want a forced slave they want to you know they want their life, their wife to love them and they want to love her and everybody's going to get along just peachy keen. Um, as long as, you know, they stay in their place. Um, the institutions try to enslave women's minds. There's the natural attractions, very powerful. Um, so, you know, I don't know. I think um, I haven't studied the research but I'm sure this is true. When people get married that first year, they do all sorts of adapting because they want to get along. And so all sorts of crap can happen and you can get into some habits that are pretty dysfunctional because the natural attraction is so powerful that it's very volatile, you know, if you start questioning. Anyway. History teaches people have always held false beliefs that eventually come out. Someone has to be the messenger. In ancient societies, people's identities followed their social roles. In modern societies, we value freedom and equality, uh, modern economies. Um, we let people decide for themselves as producers and consumers. We have free market, free choice. Um, why then? Don't you give women freedom and equality? I mean, in general, this is what we value. Um, and the importance of free and open discussion. We've got it. We've got to, you know, let the genie out of the bottle. We have to talk about this. Um, your experience cannot be evidence, right? Some guy is going to say, I've never met a woman who's interested in politics. Well, I mean, you don't give her a chance. You don't educate her. You don't talk to her. I mean, how could she be interested? You you know, you don't give her any reason to even think there's such a thing out there. And then you wonder, gee, she doesn't seem interested. It's not really natural for her to be interested. How do you know the nature of the sexes when you control things so much? Uh, women's characters are distorted. Men's characters are distorted. We don't really know human character because uh, socialization uh, perverts it in terms of sexism. Very few men know the characters of their own wives and daughters because 
um, they don't know that the everybody's compensating, right? They aren't being themselves around each other. Sometimes they're conscious of it. Sometimes they're not. They just adapt. Um, let's see. Women, okay, even it's, it's hard to understand yourself, much less to understand somebody else, especially in intimate settings where you really want to get along. Um, the policies toward women are contradictory. If women really are by nature, uh, naturally wives and mothers, why do you keep forcing them into it, right? You should make that everything equal and they will just choose to be wives and mothers, no problem, right? By forcing it, what you're saying is that, uh-oh, it's not natural, right? So I have to condition them precisely because they are capable, right? So I've got to shut the door. Okay, if, if you give women other options, men have to be responsible as, uh, as spouses, right? But if you don't give them any other options, at least you should be a, a respectable husband. Well, that's not the way the laws work. Um, men have absolute power over women, according to his legal system. They don't, they didn't have any property rights. If um, whatever is hers is his, he, they can force, there's no such a thing as rape in marriage. Even in the United States, the, the first case that went to the Supreme Court that, that determined you could have rape in marriage was in 1994. Right. So, you know, your mothers could have been the product of rape or your parents uh, because there was no legal recourse. Um, children are the property of men. If women leave, they can't take any anything. Women can force husbands can force them to return. I mean, men can be absolute dictators in their at home and in their relation to their children and their wives and he's saying wait a sec we're supposed to be a free and equal you know open society but within the home we have this extreme power differential um political despotism is rejected but personal despotism is allowed right um and that just gets you in the habit of abusing power Women, because of the situation, they can get passive aggressive. They can figure out how to punch their husband's buttons. And, you know, it's a dishonest way of life. They might be ambitious for themselves, but they can't do anything. So they're ambitious for their husbands. They push them. They, you know, force them to achieve more than the husband really is able to or wants to. Um, let's see. Family life should be based on sympathy, not despotism. Uh, but John Stuart Mill says women should have to choose between a career or a family. And we still have a legal system that makes it difficult for women to balance both. Um, the laws, the laws would not be improved unless there were people whose characters were better than the laws. Um, they have to, people who don't have any trouble because they themselves are pretty decent have to realize that these laws are allowing for evil, right? Despotism within the home. And so they're wrong. They're just bad laws. Um, philosophy and religion teaches self-sacrifice, but then women are the angels, right? And men, ah, uh, you know, boys will be boys. Okay, so then it's the job of intellectuals to see the future of the species and to blow the whistle to explain why we should change. It shouldn't be threatening. Uh, if we want to develop, if we want to flourish, we need to change. Um, and ultimately, uh, um, private happiness, right? People need to be able to live their lives as they like. Remember practical reason? Um, that's really important for people. They need that. 
All right, so each of you, which are your favorite arguments? Um, Melanie, which arguments did you like best? I liked the one where he says, hold on. Um, very few men know the characters, even of their own wives and daughters. Um, just because I think that's true. I think I think a lot of men don't know truly how powerful women are or like how wise women can be, that we actually are equal when it comes to being able to learn things and adapt to things, um, so yeah. Is it because they don't listen or because um, women feel like if they do speak, they won't, they won't be listened to or why do you think that is? Um, I think that's how society has depicted women. Um, so it's kind of just a trend, but I think, I don't know, I think, like women don't speak up enough. Um, Cause for me, if like, if you form a bond with, like if you form trust with a man and then you try to talk to him, it's so much easier and they'll actually listen to you rather than just trying to like speak over them, I guess. I just, I, I haven't watched TV for decades, like since high school, but I can't imagine some of those shows that you would sit in your living room with your spouse and watch characters acting in such gendered ways, right? I mean, aren't you going to imitate them? Or I, I don't know. I mean, I, power of TV, I have no idea. I didn't even want my kids to watch TV, so I'm out of the loop. But um, I just don't understand it, basically why you would want to do that. Um, Alex, which arguments? Um, well, I, well I, I like just the overall argument that we don't know what is natural. Okay. Um, I mean, I guess like a big example of it, or just, just like a, like out of the box example was because I have a dog right here and when he was a puppy and he is still a puppy I was doing a lot of research on how to train and um, um, how to train a dog and uh, a lot of dog trainers <clears throat> use the argument of like you have to be the alpha in a wolf pack there's an alpha um, and um, and it's, it's it's just a wrong argument that's it's the, the guy who did the study has been spending his whole life trying to correct people in, in telling them like, no, my, my research was wrong. Um, but yeah, in, in that way, like, <laughs> we, we don't know what is natural and um, our, 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 our beliefs could just one day just be flipped. 180 and like maybe it's more natural it maybe it is natural for women to be the the dominant species yeah okay all right we've never we've never run an experiment right where here you have this and this and let's see which works better right yes like, like what you said earlier yeah, okay all right so what about you mia um, so my two favorites were the, um, well, the very last one, which is that essentially like we're all people and so people have rights and so people should just, we should get to do basically what, what we desire to, well, not what we desire, but like we should get to live like an, a life that is fair and just and, you know, and then the, one of the other one was that when he said a male domination was given no thought, it just happened. So like, there's really no reason for like, like why, why are we putting so much thought into, if we, if, if that going off of that same logic, like you're putting so much thought into like, or no, no thought at all into male domination. Why are we putting any thought into like female, like e equate, equation, like equality? Like, why are we 
putting so much thought into like women's rights when we didn't even put any thought into like the allowance of men having every single right that they want. I don't know. I like that. That was an interesting thought. So what about the thought that if they really are meant to be wives and mothers, just give them all the opportunities in the whole world and they won't take them. True. True. <laughs> Why don't you just <laughs> Why? Why is that true? Because maybe they're not, you know, may, why do you keep forcing this? Because you're afraid it's a lie, right? Right. Okay. Now we have two minutes, but why don't you guys in your mind go over it? Well, actually I'll post. I made an outline for race, an argument for treating the races equally. Why is this difficult to prove? The predominance of feeling. Feeling contradicts reason, blah, blah, right? And then you do sexual orientation. Same old thing, okay? I think that's amazing. And um, when I teach it in class, you know, it's so funny because the students, when it's sexism, oh yeah, that's terrible, you know? And then when it's race, usually, four out of five you know of course but then when it comes to sexual orientation like no no that's not true <laughs> and it just like come on guys uh they just don't get it that you're you're in a certain point in history where before that it was you know exact same reasons you're holding this prejudice and there's no reason for it you don't know what gay people are like. You don't even know who they are, right? Um, and I know that because I grew up in a, a long time ago in a very Catholic town that at that time was uh, anti-gay. They just thought that was unnatural. So nobody knew who was gay or not. Everybody was in the closet. And this is, you know, an old lady speaking, right? And um, there was my mother taught art history so there was a guy who who taught weaving and we used to go to his house he would serve us sunday dinner it was really good food he had this unbelievably cool house he had a he had a bathroom that was black and silver checked <laughs> you know so you could sort of see yourself in the silver like a mirror and you know a kid is going to remember stuff like that Right. And and it nothing when I was in like 25, my mother said, well, Merle and Tom bought a house. I said, who's Tom? And she said, well, Merle's gay. And I was just like, oh, really? <laughs> so it's just it was it was all in the closet then. Um, so this Merle, he decided to come out at a certain point after I left for college, but he told this story about my dad, oh, years after, um, I think it was at their 50th anniversary or something, but he was a big member of our church and he decided, you know, people were starting to come out. And so he went to my dad and he said, okay, you can take me off all the committees because he was really a very active member. But I, I wish you wouldn't kick me out of the church because all my friends are here, right? And I'd like to be able to go to church. And my dad, he said, okay, Merle. He was in the Merchant Marines during World War II. And he said, you know, when we used to uh, go to the port and have time off, you know, all so many sailors would go and get drunk and prostitutes and all that. But there were also always some gay bars, you know, and the gay folk would go to the gay bar. And so he said to he said to Merle, he said, you know what, Merle, I think somebody should feel just as comfortable at church as they feel in a bar. So just forget it. Okay. And that's, I mean, you're literally making people, when you don't let gay people marry, they don't make that commitment. And so they don't, you know, then you say they're promiscuous. <laughs> Wait a sec. If you didn't make 
heterosexual people marry if you didn't have some socialization to make a commitment uh they would be pretty promiscuous too and then how do you define promiscuous right uh it's just ridiculous right alex i mean it just it's so absurd but anyway i'll send those outlines and i would like each of you to pick like your two favorite ones with racism and your two favorite ones with sexual orientation but just for you to get this line of reasoning through your head and that is that's what intellectuals are supposed to be able to see the future i mean i think right now it's green we've got to go green and people have to not be threatened by that. They just have to realize this is the truth, you know, but there's, it's all, you know, people are made to feel uncomfortable, blah, blah, blah. Um, okay, so I'll let you go. And what do we have? We don't have till next week. We have five days off. If you're going to write a paper, you must meet with me. If you are behind in your posts and you want, you first of all you can go look at the youtube but if you want to meet with me in office hours uh just let me know because i have some office hours thursday friday saturday nights but i am around many afternoons i just i'm not going to turn on the zoom unless you ask right because i mean i might want to go out and you know for covid take a walk or something so I don't want to just be sitting here in case a student would do that. So just, I am very available. I want everyone to be on board. I like talking about it. It's no problem. Just let me know and let me know why you're absent and just keep the communication going. That's all I ask. Okay. All right. Have a good five days. Um, I like my students. <laughs>